This generation of Christians, for the most part, does not know what a gold mine there is in the hymns and learn them. Get the hymnals, read them, pray them, sing them, learn them, memorize them. It will change your Christian life. I promise you, it will. Um, and I came to Christ when I was 19 years old. I didn't know anything. I couldn't have found the book of Romans. I didn't know the difference between uh, Hal Lindsey and A.W. Pink. The first two books that I was given as a Christian, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I started reading at night in bed as a devotional and I got attacked by demons. I threw it away. And I picked this up, this other book, I had never heard the name, A.W. Pink, The Sovereignty of God, 19 years old, began to read it, and the whole book came alive. Huh? Yeah, they left quick. Well, I think they left when I fell on my knees and I cried out to the Lord Jesus, and I knew that book wasn't from God. But, um, so, as a teenager... I became hungry to know about the works of Christ in history, the works of revival, and I began to read every author I could find. And I began to read everything I could find over, over now 35 to 37 years. And uh, if you want to study revival seriously, read men like Ian Murray. And Brian Edwards, one of the best books you could read, Revival of People Saturated with God, Brian Edwards. And J. Edwin Orr, who was the historian of revival, he chronicled and, and recorded every known revival in history that could be recorded. He did it. He wrote about 30, 35 books. Read J. Edwin Orr. Um, because... You see, the Bible calls us to remember God's works. If we don't know them, how can we remember them? Turn, if you would, to Psalm 105, Psalm 105, one verse. I want to, I want to do something tonight that, that's really impossible. I want to kind of just take us on a tour through church history and just mention when revivals have happened, starting with the Old Testament up to, up to the 20th century, just to kind of see that God has always worked in history. And here it's cyclical. In other words, there's not always revival going on. There's not always supposed to be. God doesn't purpose to always send revival. There are times and seasons, for instance, John Newton, later in his ministry, John Bunyan, before him especially, there were seasons when marvelous men of God, their whole ministry, they never saw any revival. They never saw an awakening happen. They never saw a local outpouring of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, George Whitfield, think of this, George Whitfield started preaching when he was 22. And for 34 years, until he was 56 in 1770, for 34 years, he almost saw continuous outpourings of the Holy Spirit in America and in Britain. Phenomenal. He saw things that... that most men in history never saw. So God is sovereign in these things. And Scripture calls us to remember God's works. Look in Psalm 105, verse 5. 
where the psalmist says, Remember the wondrous works that He has done and the judgments He uttered. So here, Scripture calls us to remember what God has done in the past. And it also calls us in different places to record what God has done for a future generation that our, our children and our grandchildren and a generation yet to be born might know what God has done and therefore learn from it. Somebody said the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. History is there for us. And we're a very blind, short-sighted, uh, self-centered person and, and a generation if we just see the present and we don't look at the past and learn from it for, for the future. Scripture calls us to do that. To remember and record God's works in every generation. Now, the question is, when and where have major revivals and spiritual awakenings occurred? Have there been many? Have there been few? Well, turn with me if you would uh, to another psalm, Psalm 65 and Psalm 68. One verse in Psalm 65. The psalmist gives us the perfect picture of revival. You know, the work of the Holy Spirit is compared to fire, it's compared to wind, and it's compared to water. It's pictured by these, these physical, tangible elements in creation. Wind, fire, and rain. And here the psalmist does that in Psalm 65, verse 9. The psalmist says about God, You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it with the river of God. Now, on over to Psalm 68. Verses 7 through 9. Here is a, the psalmist picture of God sent revival. Psalm 68, beginning with verse 7. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, you, notice the language, shed abroad. The same kind of language as, as pour, the outpouring or a pouring forth or an outpouring of God's presence. Verse 9, rain in abundance, you shed abroad, you restored your inheritance as it languished. So that's a picture of revival. Things are bad. Society is pagan. The, the nation which once was dominated by uh, much Christian truth with a Christian mindset, with a Christian worldview, and with morals based on biblical truth, that nation is long gone. That's no longer America at all. What she once was, she is not now. So, so it is with every nation that God sends truth to, and then that nation turns its back on God, turns its back on truth, and... Uh, absolutes and biblical morality, the nation begins to sink and decline and go down the drain. And it will continue to do so. Every nation in history has done this. It will continue to do so unless God chooses in time and in space to intervene from heaven, to pour out the Holy Spirit in great power, and to grip a nation once again. Uh, unless God does that, as an alien invasion, 
by the Holy Spirit, the nation is completely gone. Completely gone. No remedy whatsoever. But you see, even the professing church, and certainly Washington and political leaders, they don't get it yet. Even the conservative pundits, they don't have a clue. They think it can be saved by conservatism. They're dead wrong. And if I could look Rush and Hannity and those guys in the face, I would tell them that. They don't have a clue what the answer is. They would pay lip service to, you know, the Protestant God, but, uh, you know, some of them are even Mormons. And they don't have a clue what they're talking about when they start talking about spiritual things. There is no salvation for our nation educationally, politically, economically, without a national revival. But see, God lets nations get so bad where there is no hope whatsoever and He sets the stage for another awakening. I don't know if we're there yet or not. God doesn't have to send uh, a, a revival to America. He doesn't have to do that at all. But He can, and we ought to pray that He would. But here's the question. American evangelicals have often had a patriotic motive in praying for revival, which is not ultimately right. Why should God bless America so the status quo can continue and America can continue in its sin? Forget it. Why should He bless America with revival so things can just be how they've been? Rampant materialism? Everybody at ease in Zion? Self-centeredness? And sin can continue? No, He won't do that. The only reason He will send revival to a nation is to manifest His glory and to gather in a great multitude of people freshly into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to, and to gather in the elect in a new generation. That's the only reason He'll do it. He revives... His church in a nation to save multitudes of people, not just to preserve that nation uh, for the future. He sends revival for His own glory and for the sake of His Son, not for the perpetual preservation of a, of a country. And we've got to realize that. Oh, people would love to see revival just for the sake of America to be preserved. Well, when and where has God sent revival? Revivals have always been in history, even from the Old Testament era. For instance, in the days of Samuel, in the Old Testament you see the cycle of God calling Israel, the Old Covenant community. Most of them didn't know the Lord. Some of them did. But they were the covenant community, so they were called back to obey the covenant and be loyal and there were seasons when they did, but then there were seasons when Israel would apostatize and backslide and fall away and be given to idolatry and paganism. And so there were, there were times that God throughout the Old Testament history would send prophets in the days of Samuel when the people had committed evil for a long period serving Balaam. Scripture says Israel lamented after the Lord and Samuel said, if you return to the Lord with all your heart and serve Him only, He will deliver you. Well, the short narrative in Samuel's day, the Scripture tells us that they did. That is, they returned with their hearts and God delivered them from the hand of the Philistines mightily. And you see this kind of cycle throughout the Old Testament. Often in succeeding periods, when hope was almost gone and Israel was almost wiped out, by pagan nations, by idolatry. Scripture says this, verses like this, a remnant was left of those who feared the Lord. It's always a remnant. It's always a remnant. A remnant was left of those who feared the Lord in the reigns of David and Solomon and Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Josiah. There were seasons of recovery and refreshing. Recovery 
was where reformation happened. meant they were brought back to obey the covenant, to obey the worship of God as Moses had described it, reformation. But also seasons of refreshing where God's presence would come and God's glory would come. And there was great rejoicing. There was a, there was a heartfelt worship once again. And so... Soon after, for instance, the return from the captivity, there was a great reformation under Ezra in Jerusalem. Go back and read it. The book of the Law of Moses was read, remember for how long? From early morning, solidly till noon. And they all stood, hearing the Word of God. And the divine record of Scripture says, When Ezra blessed the Lord, all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands and worshiping the Lord with their faces on the ground. Ezra, under God's blessing, was used as a man of God to restore the true worship of God that had fallen into de decay, absolute decay. So you see these revivals throughout Old Testament history. The nation backsliding, God restoring, through what means? through the truth, through the Word of God, through the prophets, through the judges bringing back. And then you have this unique revival in Old Testament history. The greatest recorded revival in all the history of mankind. Where was it? Nineveh. I mean, we read past it and we don't let the awe of it sink in. Just picture this. Here's this very obedient prophet named Jonah. He paid the price to see revival, didn't he? No. The recipe for revival in Nineveh was a disobedient, rebellious prophet, a pagan city, 600,000, that had no temples, no believers, totally pagan, and God says... I'm going to save the whole bunch of them in one day. So God sends Jonah, whether by land or by sea, he's going to get there. And he did get there. And I've heard men say, Jonah came preaching repentance. No, he didn't. He came just preaching judgment, reluctantly, because he didn't want any of them saved. He started... He got mad and started sucking his thumb after God saved the whole town. I can't even fathom it. God did, uh, Jonah did not want them saved. But the Bible records, and if the record as it stands alone is just to be believed, you know, the, the question has been, did they all savingly believe? Did they all truly become believers? Well, the Bible just says they believed God. And they turned, and God relented of the judgment He was going to bring on them. And so, we're, we're supposed to believe uh, if the record itself is to be our, our standard of truth and, and what we believe. All of Nineveh turned to God in one day. And it's just astounding to think of what that means. That, that God chose in time and in space just to, with His presence, invade Nineveh and cause everyone from the king all the way down in the whole city to humble themselves and believe the message of this strange-looking prophet who came in and just said, uh, 40 days Nineveh's history. 40 days Nineveh will perish. And that's all he said. And so, Nineveh was a phenomenal uh, historical revival. And then, dark days ensued. And things began to decline. And there was, think of it, Malachi closes the Old Testament. And there's 400 years of silence. Think of it. America's not even that old. 400 years, God didn't say a thing to anybody. No prophet. No Scripture written. And yet, God has His purpose. And suddenly, suddenly, here comes the prophet that connects the two 
covenants, John the Baptist, shows up on the scene. He's in the wilderness till the time of his showing forth alone, prepared by God for 30 years. You know, God's ways are not our ways. Men today want to prepare three years and have 30 or 40 years of successful ministry. John the Baptist prepared 30 years for six months of ministry and got his head cut off. Jesus prepared 30 years for three years of ministry and was crucified. God's ways in preparing a man, a person for ministry are not modern ways at all. We've just got it all messed up and reversed oftentimes. God prepares His men in the secret place and He shapes their life and He shapes their character and He makes real the truth of God and it's burning in their heart. And preaching is not a performance to them. It's a passion. They're sent from God to a society that needs living authoritative truth. And here comes John. He's in the desert till he's showing forth. And he comes forth into the wilderness. And God sends all of Israel from all over Israel, multitudes of people, out to where John is. And now there's the first recorded New Testament era revival. John's was a saving ministry. It wasn't just water baptism. It was a baptism of repentance unto the remission and forgiveness of sins. John's was a saving ministry. It was a movement of the Holy Spirit. And so, that inaugurated revivals in the New Covenant or the New Testament era. So John's ministry was certainly that. The Lord Jesus Christ, His ministry was not that as much. There were seasons when because of His, his mighty miracles of healing, great multitudes showed up. But when He, especially you know when He, he uh, multiplied the fish and loaves and thousands were fed and then they wanted to make Him king. But when He began to talk about eating His uh, body and drinking His blood and taking up your cross and denying yourself and following Him. All the crowd went away. And finally He looked at the disciples one day and He said, you boys want to go too? And they, Peter had the only right answer, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal... We'd go if we had a, any place to go, but we know you alone have the words of eternal life and we can't. We don't have any other place to go. This place alone with you is the source of life and truth and the words of eternal life. But you did not see a revival under the ministry of Christ even like you did under John the Baptist. The next one then is when? The day of Pentecost. Now this is just amazing to me too. You have the Feast of Pentecost, and you have all these God-fearing people coming into Jerusalem, an annual feast, and from all over, you read Acts 2, and it names all the places. Think of it. They came there for this traditional feast. None of them had a clue what was fixing to happen to them. They woke up that morning, just religious worshipers didn't have any idea that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. They had no idea what was fixing to happen to them that day. And suddenly that day, there's a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and the Holy Spirit is poured out on Jerusalem. And God is at work supernaturally. And Peter, in the midst of that, stands up and preaches a gospel sermon. He stands up and preaches Jesus Christ crucified. And like an arrow, like a knife, the Holy Spirit takes that truth and He stabs those 3,000 souls that are hearing. And they are gripped. And they are regenerated. Their dungeon 
was flame with light. And their chains fell off. Their hearts were free. And they, they believed the message of the gospel. Jesus Christ, the, the crucified Messiah, was suddenly made real to all of them by the Holy Spirit. And His presence was manifested to their hearts. It was not just historical information that they intellectually uh, gave assent to. No. Christ was manifested to them. And they were converted by the power of God. 3,000 souls in a day. And so, those are the, the biblical accounts of, of revival in a general way. And you know, oftentimes in church history, it's been made to view that after the days of the apostles, and especially after about the 4th century when Constantine made Christianity the state religion, that from then to about Luther, thousand years, it was just nothing but what do they call it? The Dark Ages. And that the gospel died out, and Catholicism reigned, and there was no gospel, and the church was dead for a thousand years. That is a lie. It's an absolute lie. History even shows that it's a lie. If you want a good book about this, read a book called The Torch of the Testimony by John Kennedy. He was a missionary in India for 30 or 40 years. It's the best single volume on church history there is. And Kennedy just documents the fact that all through that thousand year period, there were the torch of the testimony of the gospel was carried forth with remnant group of believers all over the place. The gospel was alive. It was underground oftentimes. They were persecuted. The stunnedest and the brethren of the common life. And on and on. Just read it in history. The gospel was aflame all through those centuries. Is that a, is that a phone going off? Um, so, there were revivals throughout history that were occurring in those periods. And so, but what you have is, you come up to the 16th century, now stay with me here because we'll just, we'll just go through some of these centuries. And what I want you to see, this is not just, this is not fiction. This is not romantic novels. This is flesh and blood people in history. People like you and I. Men and women with their children and their babies. Pastors. Groups of churches that walked together and loved each other. They were just like us. And there were times... That as they met and they worshipped, and they were a holy minority living in a militant pagan society, just like we are. That's what the church has always been, a holy minority living in the midst of a pagan majority. And so, you have revivals happening periodically where Christ would keep His work going, where He would gather in great numbers of those He was going to save and bring them into the church, bring them into the body of Christ. And the work of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, would be advanced and accelerated by periodic, consistent, regular outpourings of the Holy Spirit, ushering in revivals. And Edwards was right in that sense that revivals have been one of the main means of God extending and continuing His kingdom. Nation spiritually born in a day. I mean, in, in a period of a few weeks or a few months. In two years in Wales, 1904, 1905, in that small country of Wales, 100,000 people, they estimate, were converted to the Lord Jesus Christ in 24 months. And they were added to the churches. And you have that kind of that kind of uh, explosion of gospel power and gospel conversion in every genuine awakening that's ever happened. Let's just walk, just walk through some of these. Eight, let's go to the 18th century, for instance, because I want to get through this. Um, 
as fruitfully as I can. 18th century is really probably the greatest century of historic revivals there ever was. It's called, in Britain it was known as the, as the Evangelical Revival of the 18th century. In America it was called what? First Great Awakening. In Britain, 18th century Evangelical Revival. In England, England was morally, it was, it was down the drain. I mean, it was gone. It was so pagan, child prostitution, thousands of orphans in the street, uh, and even the secular historians will acknowledge if, if John Wesley and George Whitfield had not stepped on the scene and started field preaching and thousands began to come and thousands upon thousands began to be converted, uh, England would have, would have perished. As a society, it would have. But the, the first great awakening was 1735 to about 1780. In England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, God raised up such men as Whitfield and Wesley, Daniel Rowland and Wells, who hit, they say that Rowland was a more powerful preacher than even George Whitfield was. Uh, Howell Harris, a school teacher, a single man, he was a school teacher. He had a burden for the lost people. He would teach school all day. He would go home, wash his face, eat some food, and he would go out door to door house to house, exhorting people, speaking to people about Christ. And he said, I'm going to visit every, every town and village within my parish. I'm going to go speak to every house. Howell Harris was the instrument to really begin the, the evangelical revival in Wales. He was the first open-air preacher long before Wesley or Whitfield ever did it. Howell Harris, read his life. It's an amazing, amazing account. At the same time, across the ocean in America, Jonathan Edwards began preaching on regeneration, 1735, 1737. And teenagers began to be uh, convicted and began to be awakened and began to be converted. And the, the revival just began to spread. More and more people in Northampton and around there began to come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit until suddenly there were seasons, there were weeks in one summer about 1736, 37, that the whole town was under conviction of sin. The whole, every house was under conviction of sin. People were weeping all night. People were coming constantly to Edwards and other ministers asking, what must I do to be saved? How can I get rid of my load of sin and my guilt? The whole, the whole region was under the power of God. And so the 18th century was a phenomenal time of revival. It was a season where God chose to work in an extraordinary way. Right on the tail end of gross darkness in Britain and in colonial America. You, you jump forward to the 19th century, the Second Great Awakening, 1800 to 1830s. And you had such men as Asahel Nettleton, who is not known very well. You ought to read his life if you want to see a true evangelist that had sound doctrine, that had a burden for souls. And Nettleton was unique. He was a graduate of Yale in 1809. And from 1811 to 1844, he preached as an itinerant preacher. He traveled, never married. And here's what he would do. He was a Presbyterian evangelist. He would go to a town by invitation only. And he would submit himself to the, to the local elders and pastors to preach as they wanted him to. They did not have special meetings. He would preach on the Lord's Day, he would preach at the stated services of the church. He would preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel. And then, he and the leaders would begin to pray for the Holy Spirit to breathe on the preaching and to begin to pre bring people under conviction of sin. And Nettleton would stay a month, two months, three months. 
just preaching at the regular services until finally God began to bring people in the community under uh, soul distress and they would begin to come agonizing over their sin. And so Nettleton, the, the estimate is over 30,000 people were converted under Nettleton's ministry in 30 years. And they were added to congregational churches or Presbyterian churches, as I said last night, where the, the, they were examined to see if they gave credible evidence of conversion. Uh, in that same era, you've heard of Robert Murray McShane in Dundee, Scotland, a young man of God, a young preacher. He had been preaching and praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. His health broke down, so in 1839, he decides he had a burden for Israel and for missions in, among the Jews in Israel. So he takes a sabbatical, he goes with a friend to Israel for a number of weeks. And then he gets a letter that revival has broken out in St. Peter's Church in Dundee, where his church, while he's gone. He had asked his friend William Burns to come and preach and fill in for him. And it was under Burn, Burns' preaching that the Holy Spirit is powerfully poured out in Dundee and scored dozens of people began to be saved and converted. And it goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. How would you like it if you were a pastor, you had prayed and labored for revival to come, you leave town and it comes under another man's preaching? Do you care who God uses as long as He works? That would really test your motives. Well, William Burns was greatly used of God all over Scotland. He went and wherever he would go, it was like a flame of God. The Holy Spirit would be poured out. Finally, in 1847, William Burns sails to China as a missionary. And eight years later, he meets the younger man, Hudson Taylor. And God puts William Burns and Hudson Taylor together and they labor together in China Inland Mission. And T Taylor said Burns was his mentor. And Burns never saw revival in China the way he saw in Scotland. And he died there serving Christ in a lonely place. You know, God has His purposes for all of us. The only thing that matters is if we are in His will, doing His will, and serving Him for the glory of Christ. It's not about us. Well, let me hurry on. Also in the Second Great Awakening, 1830s, right in there, you have other men who were laboring uh, along with Nettleton. And the whole, the whole eastern seaboard and the northeast of New England and down into the southeast saw periodic revivals. For 50 years, 1800 to 1850, the Second Great Awakening. The Third Great Awakening, we spoke of it last night, 1850s, 1857 to 1859 especially, in America, New York City, it started there, but also in Great Britain. The most powerful northern, uh, revival Ireland ever saw was in uh, Northern Ireland and also Wales, 1859. There were a group of teenage boys that were burdened for God to begin to save their friends. These young boys, teenagers, were seeking the Lord. They decided one day, they, they had a covenant together, they had a prayer pact together, and they said, let's meet at that haystack every day at a set time and let's pray. They went to that haystack and they began to pray every day. And they began to labor in prayer. They felt called to it. They wanted to pray. And these teenage boys stayed at prayer until a revival was birthed that spread across a lot of Ireland. I have seen God save dozens of teenagers. Let me tell you this story. Twenty years ago in Kirksville, Missouri, Sedalia, Missouri, there were all these teenagers. There was a bunch of them. And they began to be burdened for their lost brothers and sisters and lost cousins and lost family members. And a number of them lived in Kirksville. A number of them lived three hours away in Sedalia. So they said, let's begin to pray together. We're going to agree together in prayer and we're going to start praying 
for these family members and these friends, these other teenagers. They begin to pray regularly, faithfully. And we begin to see, and I was there one night in some meetings when several of these young men were converted, powerfully converted. And they begin to see one after another began to be saved. And all of those young people that they prayed for came to Christ. All of them did. And they're serving the Lord to this day. It was phenomenal to see. I saw that in Lynchburg, Virginia several years ago. Five years ago I was preaching there in Lynchburg. And I spoke to the young people afterward uh, in a separate meeting. And I just said, listen, why don't you start praying together? They took it to heart. And they began uh, a youth prayer meeting where they just prayed. Nobody spoke. They didn't sing. They just prayed. They began to pray for individuals. And I found out five years later that prayer meeting was still going on. They were, those young people were faithfully praying. They had seen God do many things. So revival is, is often birthed not with great, well-known, famous people. It's birthed by a praying person. It's birthed by those who have a burden and they can't get away from that and they want to stay faithful to God just to pray. And so, uh, in North America, in the 1850s and 1860s, the Third Great Awakening continued in Northern Ireland and in Wales. And then you jump to the 20th century. There were powerful revivals in Wales, 1904-1905. A 26-year-old young preacher, Evan Roberts, began to preach. And the Holy Spirit just began to sovereignly move all over Wales uh, in an amazing way. Uh, Cassia Hills, India, 1907. Korea, 1907. It became what was known as the Korean Pentecost. Two Presbyterian missionaries, William Blair and uh, a Reverend Hunt, were laboring there and the Holy Spirit of God began to breathe upon their preaching and, and upon the, the locality there. And a mighty revival broke out in Korea that lasted a, a number of months. Uh, I mentioned Duncan Campbell in Scotland last night, 1949 through 1953. They just saw astounding things for four years where God just invaded those Hebrides Islands, uh, Lewis and, and Stornoway and some other areas there, and saved, saved hundreds upon hundreds of people. Not in Nagaland, India, is another area where three major revivals have happened in the 20th century. 1956, 1966, 1972. Periodic, reoccurring, real revivals where the Holy Spirit is poured out. The Belgian Congo, 1950s. Uh, more recently, there have been some mighty college revivals. Asbury College in Kentucky in the 1970s. A revival broke out on campus. It shut the campus down. Hundreds of students were saved. Many were called to ministry and called to missions and went out of, out of Asbury as a result of that movement. The last real awakening in North America was only 40 years ago. Western Canada, in Saskatoon, Canada. A man named Bill McLeod was a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Saskatoon. A humble man. He had been saved when he was 19. And he's 90 this year, still preaching. He still works out with weights every day. He was saved when he was 19, when he had no job. There was a depression in western Canada. God powerfully saved him in his, in his mother and father's basement by reading a track on the second coming of Christ. He had no job, but he had a brilliant mind. He began to read through the Bible about six hours a day, and he began to pray about four hours a day. To this day, he's up at four o'clock, he prays till eight o'clock, he reads the Bible through about four times a year. He's probably read it through 300 times in 70 years. He's a phenomenal man. He was preaching in Saskatoon, praying, and some men came to preach. 
just a, just a planned series of meetings. And from the first night, deacons and church officers and people who seemed moral came under conviction of sin. The Spirit of God began to grip them and convict them of hidden sin, unconfessed sin, secret sin. With such misery and such conviction, they couldn't take it. They began to cry out. They began to scream. They began to fall on their face under conviction. And that revival broke out and broke open. It went for eight or nine weeks. And it went for, well, longer than that. But it went from uh, 200 people to 400. They had to move it five or six times. Ultimately, there were 2,000 people every night. The meetings would go on till midnight. And hundreds upon hundreds across western Canada were converted. They began prayer meetings and hundreds of prayer meetings sprang up all over western Canada and the northern part of the United States. And the prayer movement lasted for about two to three years consistently. So, God does this uh, widely. And it's seasonal. Our problem is we've never seen a revival. We read about it in history, we hear about it, but it's unbelief dictates to our mind we can't hardly see it happening today. It seems like things are too far gone. It seems like things are too desperate, too wicked, too much sin, too much unbelief, too much darkness. We just don't really believe it could happen again. But it is unbelief. And the reason we think that is because we think God is limited somehow by the circumstances and the conditions of society. That has nothing to do with God sending a revival. In fact, historically, when nations have gotten so dark at their worst, that's the time that God steps in and moves and works. He doesn't always, He doesn't have to, but He often has, and He can, and He hears the prayers and responds to the faith of His children who are seeking Him in every generation. Let me quickly mention a few characteristics of historic revival. There are some things that mark it. Number one, the sudden, the sudden rapidness of God's work in revival. Many conversions happen, happening suddenly and rapidly dozens of people simultaneously being converted hundreds in a period of weeks or more john sims who was one of whitfield's assistant wrote to a friend in 1743 and said this there are very few counties now listen to this translate this to texas he said there are very few counties in England or Wales, where there is not a work of grace occurring. Every county in Wales and England, he said, virtually there's revival occurring. The gospel in these days, he said, may be likened to a fire set to dried fuel. It no sooner touches and a flame arises. One sermon is preached. Many fall under conviction and are converted. And it happens day after day after day after day. In the first great awakening, it's estimated that 30 to 40,000 conversions happened in three to four years. In 1857 through 59, it's estimated two to three million converts added to churches east of the Mississippi River. In 1742, in Campus Lane in Scotland, from February to November, a small Scottish town, Campus Lane, a great work of grace, and at the peak of the movement in August of that summer, 30,000 people gathered in the open air to hear George Whitfield preach. And in that period, three to 500 were reported as being savingly brought to Christ through one sermon. In 1904, 1905, over 100,000 additions to churches in Wales. So the, uh, 
suddenness and the, the rapidness of the gospel just spreads in an amazing way when revival occurs. Secondly, the depth of the Holy Spirit's work in a season of revival. The depth of His work is, is phenomenal. How deeply conviction goes over the smallest sins. How deeply the glory of Christ is impressed on people's hearts and minds. Thomas Charles, Welsh leader in the 18th century uh, in Britain, in, in Bala, Wales, preaching in October 1791, Thomas Charles said this, about nine or ten at night, from one end of town to the other, nothing was to be heard except the cries and groans of people under conviction in many houses. And then he continues, the same night, a spirit of deep conviction fell on entire churches all around us. The following week, there was nothing but prayer meetings and general concern about spiritual matters that swallowed up all other concerns of life. Revival is a sobering, solemn, and fearful reality. The presence of God is so weighty that men are terrified. They, they get on their face and they're afraid to look up. They can't stand the weight of the holiness and the majesty and the terrifying presence of Jehovah. It's that weighty when His presence comes. I remember in Romania six years ago, Charles Leiter, Bob Jennings, Paul Washer, Scott Lee, and I decided to have some prayer before dinner. We get down to pray and this, the Holy Spirit falls in that room. And Paul Washer begins to weep. And he begins to agonize. And he begins to groan. And the fear of God came on all of us in such a way, an hour passed, an hour and a half passed, and there was nothing but groaning. And we were afraid of God. And Paul, I thought he was going to die. He, he was... I've never seen anything like it. And after that, that week, he preached for three hours to those Romanians. And the, the whole congregation was melted and were on their faces weeping. And marriages were healed. And relationships that had been broken were made right. When God comes, everything changes. Everything is, ex is exposed. Everything is naked and open before the God with whom we have to do. Are you hiding sin? God, the depth of the Holy Spirit's work in revival is astounding. And it cannot be humanly produced. It cannot be made to happen. It's a sudden, sovereign coming of God upon His people. A prayer meeting was held in Wales in an open field attended by, they, they estimated, 18,000 people in a prayer meeting in Wales. Called by some, quote, the most remarkable time ever seen in South Wales. Thousands praying silently in tears. It was called an intense time, heavy with the presence of God. A man named Thomas John, who was present, walking in a nearby field, was lost in reverence. He withdrew. He couldn't take it anymore. He withdrew to a field and he was lost in reverence. A friend saw him and ran to him and said, Dear brother, what a glorious sight this has been. Did you ever see anything like it, John? His reply, I didn't see anything. I saw no one but God. I'm going home. 
How divinely terrible is this place. It's too terrible, meaning fearful. It's too fearful for me. My flesh is too weak to bear this weight of glory. God doesn't send revival in some places because the church couldn't take it. We couldn't stand it. We're not ready for it. The great reality is <clears throat> in different generations, different centuries, God has purposed to send a revival in places. So you know what He does? He raises up a praying man. He raises up a praying band. He burdens them. He initiates God-given, genuine burden and desire for prayer. And He calls them to pray. He equips them with a prayer life. And they begin to pray. And then he raises up preachers, powerful preaching. And he sends a man to begin preaching, like John the Baptist, like a Gilbert Tennant, like Whitfield, like Howell Harris, like John Elias, Christmas Evans in Wales, Spurgeon. Spurgeon went to Scotland in 1859 during a season of revival, and he preached to 30,000 people in the open air in Scotland. People don't know that. They think he just preached in London, you know, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. But Spurgeon saw phenomenal things like that. D.L. Moody. God raised up D.L. Moody as an instrument of grace. He wasn't a Calvinist. I'm sorry God used him. And I'm glad God used him. A 26-year-old, a 56-year-old, many men sent from God during a time of God's chosen purpose to send an awakening, and God uses prayer and He uses the preaching of the Gospel. Just the clear, plain, honest, bold, Doctrinal, passionate, straightforward preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. Preaching of the cross. And the Holy Spirit comes. And He descends and He comes on a congregation like dew descends on the morning grass. He comes. When He has come, when He, when he has come, He will convict, convince the world of sin and righteousness, and judgment to come. And simple men, as John Knox said, simple men preach, and God gives the Holy Spirit in great abundance. Revive Thy work, O Lord. Make bare Your arm. Come once again. Lord Jesus, this world this nation, this generation blasphemes Your name. You're not getting the glory You deserve. You're being dishonored among the sons of men. Lord, would You not come again and get glory to Yourself? Would You not revive Your work in the midst of the years? It's not about God preserving a nation. It's about God honoring His Son and making much of His Son and bringing many sons unto glory with His Son and advancing the kingdom of His Son. That's what it's about. God can do it again. And let us be about the business of prayer and preaching faithfully because those are the things God always revives His work again. And may God have mercy upon us. Let's pray.
Father, tonight in a small way we have remembered your works. As Psalm 105 says, just Lord, just a, just a drop. Just think of the words of that hymn. How great are the works of God. All thy ways are matchless, godlike, and divine. But the fair glories of your grace, more godlike and unrivaled, shine. Lord, you're the God of history. You're the God of the nations. You're the God of Moses and Elijah and Isaiah. The God of David. The God of the Shekinah glory who was in the cloud and the, and the fiery pillar. The God who was in the burning bush that Moses out of holy curiosity drew aside to behold. Oh Lord, it's You we want. It's You we need. It's You we long for. Father, I pray tonight that You would bring forth the fruit from what You've said tonight in many hearts. And I ask that it would be fruit that would remain. Call people to a life of prayer. Equip us for this hour, for this day. Lord Jesus, Nothing would delight our hearts more. And we would, we would sing for joy. We would shout for joy. We would greatly rejoice if we hear that a genuine revival has broken out. Lord, You can do it in San Antonio. We don't care where You do it. We just ask You to do it again. Somewhere, Lord, in this nation... Have mercy upon us. We look to You. Thank You for grace. Thank You for Your kindness. Thank You for Your presence. We bless You. We thank You for the everlasting Gospel. We thank You for the Gospel of the grace of God. We thank You for the saving power of Christ Jesus. Father, we pray in His name. We ask You to work in our hearts for Your glory and for the good of Your church.